Uh, you know, I, I really appreciate y'all doing that pastor's appreciation thing. I didn't have a clue. I've come a long way. I remember when, <laughs> when we first started the church. I was like, y'all, I, I actually gave, gave an announcement from the pulpit. I said, y'all be coming around here with all this pastor's appreciation stuff. Because, you, know? you know, I hate to say it. It's just the way I was raised, you know, by my, the way my dad was. It's like anything that was good went way over the top and became bad. And uh, But anyway, uh, through the years, especially after we hired Angie and Naya, uh, Angie, she was like, no, we're not going for that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're going to sit right here and you're going to receive this appreciation. <laughs> Praise God. <clears throat> With that said, I'm not trying to take any weight off of that. I really do appreciate it, but I want to say I appreciate y'all. And I mean that. And, you know, as I was thinking about how much I appreciate the people that do keep coming back to this church, um, I thought of a time whenever I was a, a kind of like a teenage boy. This is, it's kind of kind of funny, but not really funny. So to my little sister, Cynthia, I just want you to know you probably still watch the videos. Love you very much. I'm here to admit to you that Big Brother was not a good Big Brother. Well, anyway, with that said, I kind of feel like, so, so this is what would happen. Her and I would have a little bit of a disagreement. You know, do brothers and sisters have disagreements? Just not always as intense, maybe, as what me and Cynthia's were. Well, even though I was really kind of a messed up young man, I've to shared y'all my testimony with y'all before, how I was really messed up. I, I mean, like, if you can only imagine the things that a person does in my life the way that I was, and some of y'all have been messed up too, then you just, then you take that and you realize the attack that's going on in your mind that's driving you to do these kinds of things. And so the point is, is that I knew that it wasn't okay to be like violent towards my little sister, right? And so I'm sitting here, this is when MTV first became a thing, and I'm sitting in the living room, and whatever would happen, we'd get in an argument. And, then, and, and, and so I'm always, uh, for whatever reason, I was always thirsty. Okay, and we had one of those Kentwood dispensers with the ice thing, and I had, mom had these big mugs, and I'd fill it up with ice, and I constantly had a thing of ice water in my hand, and I'd sit there and break it. I'm over here watching MTV. I know it's not, it, it is what it is. And so me and Cynthia would get into a disagreement about something, and she would say something, and then I would say something, and then it would escalate, and it was almost like she didn't know how to stop anymore than I knew how to stop. And at some point in time, Instead of doing something that was really stupid, I just did something that was kind of stupid, and I would just take that glass of ice water and I'd just chuck it in the face. <laughs> what is my point? My point is sometimes that's kind of how my preaching is. Sometimes my preaching is like a cold glass of ice water, ice water in the face. And so for that, I thank you that you keep showing up. And then if my preaching is like a cold glass of ice water in the face. But one of the things that I've noticed is, is that it's a whole lot. Because yeah, a, a cold glass of ice water in your face will also wake you up. Now kind of wake you up if you need to be woke up. <laughs> she didn't need to be woke up, so that was very nice. <laughs> but, but if you needed to be, like in other words, if the house was on fire and nobody could arouse you because of smoke inhalation and they threw a glass of ice water in your face and it woke you up and got you up and helped you be rescued, hallelujah, that was a good time for a cold glass of ice water to hit us in the face. And sometimes I believe that that's kind of like the condition of where we are right now. Uh, and not everybody's going to be okay with that type of preaching. But I do know this. I appreciate the people that do keep coming. It doesn't mean that there's not other good preachers out there. It doesn't mean that their deliveries aren't great. I believe that there's many, many men of God that are awesome men of God. And the Lord continues to show me that. And, he start, and, he's, and he's really revealing to me that maybe everybody isn't as bad as I thought they were. Hallelujah. And if they love Jesus, well, then pray. Praise God, but if you know, I want him just to preach the truth. Praise God. All right, hallelujah. All right, so look, we are in 1 Kings chapter 21, and I am going to um, read verses 1 through, um, let's see, verse 14. Y'all ready? All right, here we go. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel. Hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. In other words, it was right next door to Ahab's palace. And Ahab spoke unto Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs. 
because it is near unto my house and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. Or if it seem good to you, I will give you the worth of it in money. And Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said unto him, why is your spirit so sad that you eat no bread? You ever asked yourself that question before? Why is my spirit so sad? Right? That's a good question for us to ask. I mean, it's com completely different. Doesn't really have anything to do with my message, really. But as I was reading that, you know, poor Ahab laying in his bed and his, and his spirit so sad. We need to ask ourselves that sometimes. You know, David, David, the psalmist, the king, he said, Saul, why are you downcast within me? Yeah. He spoke to himself. So, listen, if you're a child of God this morning, I don't need you to raise your hand, but if you're a child of God, acknowledge it in your spirit. In other words, if you have received Jesus Christ, if you have ever prayed one of those prayers where you invited Jesus into your heart and you asked him to be your Lord, even if you didn't really understand exactly what it meant, the word of God says that you are a child of God. And if you feel different today than after the day you prayed that prayer, that means that the Holy Spirit moved on the inside of you and the Holy Spirit is hope, the Holy Spirit is joy, the Holy Spirit is peace, and the Holy Spirit wants to give you victory. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is, if I'm downcast, we need to ask ourselves, soul, why are you downcast within me? Why is my spirit so sad? Amen. That's a good question to ask if we're feeling that way. It's a good question for me to remind myself to ask. Amen. Because see, look, sometimes whenever your spirit's down, when you, when you, when your soul is downcast, you're opening yourself up if you don't let the Lord come in and heal you. You're opening yourself up to let something else come in and heal you. Jezebel's about to walk up in the bedroom. I ain't preaching on Jezzy this morning, but I, we done heard enough of her name. Lord knows. I'm about tired of hearing her name. But anyway, she is in the story. <laughs> I'll just say Jezzy's about to walk in the room and you don't want Jezzy to, to give you what it is that you don't want. Because right. she probably looks good. There's one yeah. spot. Oh, I ain't getting it. All right, here we go. <laughs> but Jezebel, his wife, came in to him and said unto him, Why is your spirit so sad? Why don't you eat bread? And he said unto her, Because I spoke unto Naboth, the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else if it please you, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. And Jezebel, his wife, said unto him, Dost thou not govern the kingdom of Israel? In other words, are you the king or not, man? <laughs> Arise and eat bread and let your heart be merry. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. <laughs> so she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with a seal and sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in his city, dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote in the letter saying, Proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people and set two men, sons of Belial, that means some wicked men, before him to bear witness against him. In other words, we're just going to create a whole lie. Has anybody ever lied on you like that? I know some of you teenagers know what I'm talking about. I'm, one of the things you got to understand, though, if you're a teenager and you've been lying on, we're all a room full of adults. We've already been where you are. And the reality of it is, is that nothing's changing under the sun. Solomon said that. It, it, it doesn't change. If they lied on us back in the 80s or the 50s or the 40s or whatever, however old we were, if they lied on us back then, they're still going to lie because it's the same spirit that's operating in people that's trying to destroy us and trying to bring us down. But praise God that you have been exposed to the truth. You've been exposed to the word of God. And, and depending upon what you do with that word, it can completely transform your life. Amen. All right. So he says, I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. And so set two men before him and then carry him out and stone him that he may die. Verse 11. 
And the men of his city, even the elders and the nobles who were the inhabitants in his city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them. And as it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them, they proclaimed a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. And there came in two men, children of Belial, and sat before him. And the men of Belial witnessed against them, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. And then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. You know, last night I went to a, uh, to a service at Cornerstone. I actually went Friday night and last night. And it was really good. They celebrated their 40 years of ministry. And uh, the preacher last night spoke on destiny. And one of the things that he said is, is that the devil can't just kill you. Like if you are a child of God, God has a destiny for your life. Amen. He has a destiny for you. He has a destiny for me. Our destinies may look different. My hope and prayer is that I end up going to Uganda and a couple other countries before it's over with and preaching the gospel of Amen. Jesus Christ. There's other people to hear the word of God. My, my desire is that God would give us more people that we could disciple and really the declaration uh, that, you know, that went forth this morning whenever we were talking about the idea. One of the things that I felt like with the Lord wanted me to say to you today, because I got I got a bunch of words when I went over there. I'm just going to be honest with you. And I'm not really the guy that looking looking for words, but I kept getting different people were giving me different words. And one of the words that was given to me was you're not to produce fruit. You're to plant trees. And then the prophet that spoke to me, he was, he was kind of like a hardline prophet because, you know, whenever the Spirit's moving on me, a lot of times my lips are moving because I'm praying in tongues. He said, quit, quit all that. <laughs> quit all that. You're doing all that talking. I'm the one talking over here. Listen to me. And so I was like, yes, sir. I'm, I've got to hear the rest of what he got to say. Well, his wife came over to me last night and she sat down next to me and Danielle probably opened up and said, she just probably wanted to make sure you were okay and that you weren't offended. That don't offend me, praise God. That don't offend me. And, when he, and she said, you know, I read a story one time that you can count how many seeds are in an apple, but you can't have, count how many apples are in a seed. Ooh. And I started thinking about that word even at another level. I was so thankful for that word that because I do believe that there's so much truth in that. But it's not just for me, it's for you too. Because you see, as we come together and we learn the word of God like this and we see the Holy Spirit anointing us for a specific purpose. And one of the things that I believe with all of my heart that many of the people that keep coming back in this place are starting to feel in their spirit a zeal and a desire to share their faith with other people. Now listen, at different levels, I get it. Some of y'all, we went knock on doors recently. Some of y'all talking to people at festivals about stuff. Some of y'all buying books and handing them out. Some of y'all, you, you you get the point that there's various ways and 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 and, and we went to the festival and we, and we handed out tracts and we told people about Jesus. Some of y'all at work, y'all are talking to people about Jesus. Matter of fact, I guarantee if I ask you to raise your hand, how many of you told somebody about Jesus in the last month, that there'd be a whole lot of people. Go ahead, raise your hand if you talked to somebody about Jesus in the last month. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing. Right. And so what I'm trying to say, though, is this, is that I believe that that word was true. And more than that, for for just me, I want that to be for you, yeah. that you would be tree planters, because and think about it as we go forward and bring seed and put it inside of the ground. Hallelujah. It just keeps happening and we keep reproducing. And this is something that the Lord has been showing me. And I got some of this. In my message, amen. But I titled my message this morning, A Vineyard and the Inheritance. You know, Jezebel's a foreigner in the story. Again, I don't want to talk too much about her but uh, this morning, but we, we've, we've done some teaching on her recently. And one of the things that I learned about Jezebel is that she doesn't come from Israel. She actually was the daughter of a Sidonian king named Ethbal. And I'm not going to get into the map and all this kind of stuff like that. But basically, she came from a place where it was heavily influenced 
by the demonic. It was heavily influenced by the, the world of the occult um, and that her father would have been very powerful in the occult, there was a there was a there was a very occultic world going on at that time um, that was out in the open. Uh, basically, whenever they lived, I mean, even in the showdown with Elijah, because this is during the time frame of Elijah in this story that we read. In the time frame of Elijah, that was whenever uh, Elijah went to the uh, Mount Carmel. And he had a showdown with the prophets of Baal. And he told him, he said, go ahead and build your altar and do your thing. And if you'll remember, they, they started to do, they started to cut on themselves. They started to try to invoke demonic spirits, right? And, and, and I just want to say that they, and, and they were, it was very out in the open. And, and, and the occult world was very out in the open. And Elijah stood up in the midst of all of that and proclaimed the truth of God. What I want you to know is this, though, is that even though sometimes it seems like the occult isn't out in the open today in modern society, that's not really true. The occult is actually out in the open. We just have been blinded to it and desensitized to it, right? And, and, and what I want you to know, because, and again, I didn't even really... I'm getting, I feel like I sound like a broken record sometimes whenever I talk about different ways that the enemy can come in. Okay, we talk about it. I know I say it almost every message, and, and I'm sorry, but I'm not really sorry. Social media, the music industry, you know, various things like that that try to entice us to go in a direction that is opposite of the will of God. And what I'm trying to tell you is, is that, okay, for instance, I bought a, 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 a rock and roll documentary uh, back, I don't even know how long ago it was, that exposed the rock and roll industry. It was called They Sold Their Souls for Rock and Roll. The only reason I'm pointing this out is, and most of you can say, yeah, but I don't listen to Marilyn Manson. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I get that. I had, I had though, and, and listen, what I'm talking to you about this morning, just to let you know, many of you already know, I've experienced it personally in my own life with family members. So, so it's been a, something that's personally touched me. And it's not enough that you teach people about it, because even though you teach people about it, try to teach your own children about it, if they open up doors and allow the influence to come in, and that's a big part of my message this morning, that the enemy can still come in if they give permission to the enemy to come in. And in this particular video, and I'm pretty sure that I had my daughter watch this part with me, but it had to do with Marilyn Manson, and he was up there, and he was actually, he had a fake pulpit up there. And it was like he was, and he had, he was bleeding all over the place. Okay. And, and, and he had this pulpit up there and he had a Bible and in the Bible, he was ripping the pages out and he was throwing them in the crowd. And he was, he was making fun of the Bible and on the cover of the album, it said, you better raise your children because if you don't, I will. Hmm. And then I would see these young girls come in because as a pediatric nurse practitioner and they were struggling with these various things. And I can remember this went on for about a week or so, and I started to ask these young ladies, do you mind if I ask you a question? Because see, psychology is not going to ever agree with what Pastor Matt says, as even as a, as a nurse practitioner that works in pediatrics. I tried to ask them one time at a psychiatric conference, and they just looked at me like I was kind of foolish. But I could see that even though some people looked at me like I was foolish, they had to think for a second. They pondered it in their mind. Because you see, the Bible talks about that. And that was what was happening with the prophets of Baal. And these girls that were in the, in the room, I asked them, do you mind if I ask you what, what group, what music you listen to? And, and, and some of you may not listen to this kind of music. And, and I don't know, I never went and listened to one of the songs, but she, three of them within a week's time told me, Black Veiled Bride. It don't take much of a rocket scientist to figure out what this is about. I mean, it just really doesn't take much of a noodle dance like PB and J used to say. You just bump a couple of neurons together and you can feel it, fit, figure it out. And so I did. I Googled it at least to see what they looked like. And it was, it was what I thought. The point that I'm trying to make is this, is that when we are vulnerable and we allow ourselves to bring this kind of stuff in, there's a message that's involved within this. And in that message, they're sitting there and they're bombarding our mind and they're bombarding our life with these things over and over again. And then the enemy now, we've given him an entryway to come in and see, and that, for people that don't believe in the demonic realm or in the spiritual realm, it's, they, they're really going to think you're fanatical. 
I mean, come on, you fool. You know, uh, people that operate only from a scientific mind are going to think you're really foolish. But for those of us that know that there's a spiritual realm, we should understand that that is a dangerous thing that we can open up doors right. and allow these things to affect us. Right. right? So Jezebel is a foreigner. She's living in a time frame where she comes from, where the world is very occultic. I just wanted to make that connection for you to know that even though we're not living back then, that this stuff is still alive. Because you see, it's not just the story is not just about Naboth and it's not just about his vineyard and his inheritance. The story is about the earth that we live on. The story is about what's going on in the here and now. The story is about your life and how it's interconnected to this story that's in the Bible. The story is about your physical existence in this temporary world. And that one day, your temporary existence in this temporary world is going to be done. And then, like I've been talking about, there's going to be judgment. And it's either going to be the great white throne judgment, which you don't want to go to that one. Trust me, no matter whether you believe it or not, it's going to happen. The word of God says it. And then if it's not the great white throne judgment, then you and I will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And there we will give an account for the works that we did while we were at the bottom. And so all of this stuff is intertwined. Amen. And, and so, so Jezebel's a foreigner. Uh, she's an outsider to the Israelites, but she entered the kingdom and she brought her ways into the kingdom because, see, Ahab married her. Ahab disobeyed the written word of God that he had at the time. You understand that? That's so powerful. Ahab knew as an Israelite and as an Israelite king that the word of God that was given by God to the children of Israel during the book of Leviticus before they, while they were still in the wilderness, before they entered into the land of Canaan, do not intermarry with them. Do not be unequally yoked. Now listen, this can go for you're not supposed to marry an unbeliever and then somebody screams from the crowd, but I already, I'm already, I, I wasn't a Christian when I got married. Now I got saved. My husband's not. Well, then you hold on to Jesus, sis. You hold on to Jesus, bro. And you keep holding on and you keep praying because that's where you are in life. And as long as that man or that woman is willing to stay with you, then that's what you have to do according to the word of God. You let that man or woman stay with you. Now, again, I'm, I'm not going to re-preach last time's message. But the point is, is that there's always situations and circumstances. I'm just telling you what the word of God says. And that's what my job is to do is to proclaim the word of God and to let you know. It says that the unbeliever wants to leave, let him leave. And if the unbeliever wants to stay, let him stay. And what you're to do is, is you are to bombard heaven for that unbeliever's soul. Amen. And, and even if you have a believer in the house and he ain't acting right, you're supposed to bombard heaven right. for their soul. Amen. And keep holding on to God until the end. Amen. That's what that's what we are to do. And so, but Ahab transgresses the written word of God. And I think that's so important that we that we stay there just for a second. Because I cannot communicate to you or anybody that would watch on video the importance enough of stay, of learning the word of God. Because you're not going to plead ignorance. I mean, even, even in the physical realm that we live in, the policeman is going to say ignorance of the law is no excuse. You're not going to stand before the judge of the universe and say, but I didn't know. No, I, people died for this word. The preacher preached the word. Amen. You rejected the word. All right. So when the word of God is written and communicates to you the truth, I'm telling you for your good, for my good, let us learn a lesson. How many people, don't raise your hand. But this is the question. How many of you in this house believe in God and have gone against the word of God and have seen the result of it? And some of you, it's been really, really painful. Some of you, just a little bit of a skin prick because you, okay. But anyway, you get the point. There's always consequences, to it, right? So Ahab marries this woman, Jezebel, daughter of a Sidonian king, brings the occult into the nation, brings the occult into the kingdom. God's whole plan on earth hinges on having a people that will carry his truth. She's introducing her ways into the kingdom. His image, he wants his truth, his image, his glory upon the earth. It's because of his love and his grace that he even created mankind. Yes. Amen. I keep thinking about that. See, God is love. And again, 
If God is love, then true love wants reciprocation. That's the beauty of the, of the plan of God. That, that he created us so that he could have an eternal family. A family is supposed to be the place where love can really be practiced. Amen. And some people's families are much more functional than others. But even in dysfunctional families, I think that we can agree that there's been times whenever we could feel the true love. Or at least the way that it was supposed to be as we did. We loved one another. Amen. Even though sometimes it, it ends up in heartache and pain. Uh, there were times that we can remember, man, if it just would have been like this and then we fold the word of God into it and we think, man, if we just, if it could have just been like this, it could have been, it could have been, well, it could have been the way God intended it to be. Had we all known the word of God and had we all lived according to the word of God. And so that's a big part of God's plan is to have a people that will carry his truth, his image and his glory upon the earth. Amen. Because there's not a better place for love, the love to be to be exhibited than within a family. And God's plan is part of creating an eternal family. Like, in other words, I need you to understand this. Like, I know when you walk out of here, I need to start putting some signs on the wall to remind you of something on your way out the door. But I know when you walk out of here, you're going to walk right back up into the physical realm. And the things that are trying to pull on you, they're going to try to pull on you. And they're going to try to grab a hold and take take authority or to try to place themselves in your mind and to try to make you think about those things instead of the things that we talk about the, the physical realm and how how it pulls on us but but what I need you to understand is is that there really is an eternity I, I need you to get that from me there really is an eternity Amen. there really is a day whenever you're going to breathe your last breath or either the Lord the Lord's going to, judgment's going to come. One way or the other, the end is going to come. You know that. I know that. And there is an eternity that lies on the other side of the spiritual veil. And he wants to have a relationship with us on this side. And he created this physical realm as a place for the physical to exist. But this physical journey is a test. I'm telling you right now, this physical journey is a test and the response in the physical has a direct, direct impact on the spiritual eternal inheritance that he has planned for his children. You, you know, the reality of it is, is that if, if your mama and your daddy had a lot of money and you don't act right, you might get written out the will. Now, I'm not trying to talk about once saved, always saved right now, whether you can lose your salvation. What I'm trying to, the point that I'm trying to make is this, is that God the Father wants a family and he's made a way that we could become part of that family. And if we reject that way, we can lose the inheritance that he had planned for us. Amen. Amen. In Adam, God gave man power and authority over the physical realm. We've been talking about that more recently. Seven times in the book of Genesis, he said, he said, reproduce after your own kind. But then he also talked about having dominion over the earth. Yeah. Be fruitful, multiply, have dominion yes. over the earth. See, God created the earth for Adam. God created the earth for you and I for this physical existence to take place. And God gave authority to Adam. And I really am excited about <clears throat> over the next couple of weeks <clears throat> on Wednesday nights. I feel like the Lord's really been showing me some things about the glory of God. And I'm going to be excited to share that. All these things are kind of interconnected. But God gave man authority over the physical realm and this was God's creation and he entrusted it to Adam. For you as an individual, God has placed you in an authority position even within your family, your family unit, but as a believer, he's also given you spiritual authority as you walk upon the earth to be able to believe a believer and to be able to cast those seeds of truth out there expecting that there's going to be a reward in the end. Amen. That God's going to use you that way. Right. So it, he entrusted it with Adam and the, and the spirit of the serpent was already in existence before that even took place. Meaning the meaning Satan had already fallen. Right. And, and just like Satan, Jezebel in the story has a plan to intrude. So Satan, as this serpent, 
intrudes into the garden. And whether this fallen angel as a spiritual being possessed the serpent, transmuted into the form of a serpent. I don't really know. I don't know that I really care that much. All I know is that he was a spiritual creation that had rebelled in time past against God. And he was not content as a creation of God and instead wanted to be above God. So he rebelled against God through his rebellion. He brought about his own spiritual death. And now he sees Adam and this new creation. He sees Adam's authority and he wants it. So he takes on the form of the physical and enters so he can steal the spiritual. He failed his test. And now he wants Adam and us to fail on us. Yeah. Last night, I was pretty amazed because my message had already been written. And I went to go hear this guy preach. And he was actually preaching on the time frame of Elijah. And, he, and part of the story had to do with Jezebel. But then in addition to that, he, all of a sudden in the middle of his sermon, he stops and he tells a story about how he had bought property and he had about 18 chickens because his wife wanted chickens and that she went one morning to go get the eggs and there was a snake in there, in the chicken coop. And she, and she said, get one of the boys to get their gun and to shoot the snake. He's like, no, my papa, my daddy told me what to do with a snake. So he said he went and got a rake and he got a shovel and he pulled the snake out with the rake and then he cut the snake's head and then his wife said, cut its tongue off too. <laughs> So he cut the snake's tongue off. He cut his tail off too. So he cut the tail off and then he took the snake. And it, it was actually in his garden. He had a chicken coop in the garden that was part of the bigger piece of the property. Okay, this guys he's really a trip. He's an interesting character. But he said, then I took that snake and I threw it out of my garden. And he said, oftentimes I'll use this. I'll use this analogy to let people know I live in a snakeless garden. I live in a snakeless garden because that was my garden and that snake showed up in my garden and I exerted authority over that snake and I threw it out of my garden. And guess what? I ain't giving it permission to come back. I'm not giving the snake permission to intrude. But yet Satan intruded into the garden because Adam gave him permission because he believed Satan's lie instead of believing the word of God. And God said that you can eat from any tree in this garden except for this particular tree. But whatever God had offered him obviously wasn't enough because Satan came in there and promised him something. He promised him light, but the light actually resulted in darkness. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That's why our flesh must be tested on this side before we will be able to enter into the kingdom of God. It's very important that you understand that, church. I don't know what they're teaching. I mean, I kind of know a little bit, and I don't want to talk about other people's churches. But what I want to say is this, is that it's not just all a campfire where we sing Kumbaya and we just talk about the fact that we love one another. We're in an actual spiritual warfare. The enemy is not happy. And if he can get you to believe a lie and if he can give a, get a preacher to preach a lie and the people will believe it, then, then everything seems fine until it's not fine anymore and there's nothing more that can be done about it. Yes. Because then the talk is over and the time now for judgment takes place. The story is a setting of a physical place where a spiritual battle is taking place. Like a garden, a vineyard, a church, a workplace, a home, a family. And then a spiritual intruder disguised in a physical body with plans to kill and destroy. The only way that it can enter and cause trouble is if the will and the natural gives permission to the demonic and the spiritual. Yep. And Adam did it. And it brought death, chaos, confusion, rebellion into the narrative of God. The serpent was an outsider looking for a way into the plan of God. He's always looking for a way. He uses Jezebel as an opening to get into God's kingdom on earth and the nation of Israel during that time. I could probably go through and give you all kinds of examples of the people of God through the history of God that Satan used to allow intrusion into the kingdom of God to bring confusion and chaos. The word of God says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, to be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, roams around seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for somebody to give him permission. He's looking for somebody, but you don't have to. That's the good news. We don't have to give him permission. 
God has a plan for the human race. He's looking for people that will be his people to help him bring this plan into place. There's going to be opposition. There will be tribulation. But praise God, he's worthy of it all. Amen. Amen. That's right. Praise God, he's worthy of it all. Yes, he is. Thank you, Lord. Who usually sings that song? Naya. Naya? Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. All right. Because I'm not even going to try. I want to. <laughs> He's worthy of it all. Sing that, Lord. For, for from you are all things. Sing that, Lord. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things into you are all things for from you are all things into you are all things you deserve the glory sing it one more time you're worthy come help me sing it you're worthy of it all saying that there's going to be opposition, there's going to be trial, there's going to be tribulation, but I want you to know he's worthy of it all. Amen. Amen. We've talked enough about Jezebel, but look, the topic of today's message is Naboth's inheritance. God has a plan for his people. His plan is his family. According to the New Testament, the sons of God have received an inheritance. I want to read with you real quick this passage out of Matthew chapter 25, because I believe it's a good parable to describe uh, what I'm trying to talk about as far as inheritance. And, and, and even though there's a, a, an immediate context, and we'll talk about that after we read it, uh, there's also an overall context having to do with the big plan of God. You know, I shared this a long time ago. Y'all probably wouldn't remember. Some of y'all weren't even coming to church here. I was driving down the road one day, and the Lord had me pre prepare a message. And, uh, and in the message, it talked about the big plan of God. And the Lord said, from now on, I want your preaching to reflect this. I want your preaching to reflect my big plan along with their individual lives. God wants you to understand how your individual life affects the big plan of God and how the big plan of God affects your individual life. He wants you to understand how you exist within the bigger picture of what he's doing upon the earth because you're not just a solitary island living in the midst of the Pacific Ocean. You're part of a people group known as the Church of God. Amen. And so even in this parable, I want you to know that there's a level of truth connected to that. So we're, met, we're in Matthew chapter 21. We're going to read verses 33 through 41. And it says, here another parable. There was a certain householder. We're going to just say, we're going to call it a landowner. Okay. A certain landowner, which planted a vineyard. He hedged it round about. In other words, he put a fence around it and he dug a wine press in it. So when you have a vineyard, when it's harvest time, you got a wine press. That way you got all, everything you need right then and there to be productive, to get your harvest going, right? He dug a wine press in it. He built a tower and then he led it out to husbandmen. Some translations say tenants, okay? So it's, I don't know if the right word would be a sharecropper, but you get the idea. He, somebody comes and rents, he built, the, he, he built everything, he planted a vineyard, and then he said, all right, I'm going to lease this property to you. I need you to bring in the harvest, and then once you bring in the harvest, then we'll, do our, we'll divvy everything up once you bring in the harvest, okay? And he says, and when the time uh, and then, I'm sorry, it says that he, he, he got, he hired some, uh, where was I, what, what version? Huh? 33. 33, thank you. 
It says, uh, wine prince and husbandmen went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one, killed another, stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, they will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance and they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those husbandmen? Now, listen, the direct context has to do with the fact that the Lord God of heaven and earth has planted a vineyard. And for a period of time, he let Israel be the husbandmen. But they beat the prophets. They rejected the prophets in the Old Testament. And then he said, finally, I'm going to send my son. Surely they'll reverence my son because they've been waiting the whole time throughout my word. I've been telling them he's coming and they're going to reverence him. And no, they didn't. They said, let's seize upon him. Let's kill him and let's take his inheritance. Wow. And that's exactly what took place. Yeah. And the Lord in the parable says, what do you think he's going to do to them? That treated his stuff improperly. He's going to kill him. And he's going to, but then it goes on to say he's going to find somebody else to take care of it. And that comes to the church. Now, I don't know if the church is doing a whole lot better than Israel. Yeah. But, but anyway, we know that we have a remnant. Praise God. And we're going to believe God that, his, that we're going to operate in his will upon the earth. But I need you to know the parable doesn't stop there. Because you see, the outside forces of the world desire to do the same thing because we got to understand that what those Pharisees did was just a physical representation of what the enemy wants to do. The enemy wants to seize upon the heir of God. I'll never forget, it was actually your son, Miss Cheryl, when he and I were talking one time when he lay prostrate in his living room for about eight to ten hours. I don't remember how many hours it was one day. And one of the things that John told me was this, the Holy Spirit directly spoke to his heart and told him this, they want to steal the throne of my son. He was talking about the demonic entities. The Lord was showing John that they want to steal the throne of my son. They want to take the heir. They want to steal his crown. They want to, they want to try to exert power in that sense. And so this story still lives on today in our lives and your yes. life. The enemy wants to steal your inheritance. If you're saved this morning, I want you to know that you have protection against the deceptive plans of Satan. Amen. If you're truly saved, you've experienced God's entry into your physical world. He, he lives in you. He spoke. You responded, invited him in. He is there and now wants to protect you from the intrusion of the enemy. You don't have to be intruded upon. You don't have, we don't have to be deceived anymore. Most of the time when we are deceived, it's kind of because we still think we want to be deceived. Mm -hmm. What does it take for the Lord to reveal to us and to make it real to us that we don't really want to be deceived? Mm -hmm. How much pain, how much heartache <laughs> does it take to cause us to really just bow to me? I mean, I kind of know a little bit about what it's taken for me. I wish I could tell you that I'll listen the first time. You get the point. So something happened in your life and in your heart, like Jesus told Nicodemus. So if you're saved this morning, something happened spiritual, right? And, and Jesus told Nicodemus, and I'm kind of paraphrasing, you may not know where a breeze specifically originated from, but you can feel the effects of the wind. You know it's real because it, it brushes upon you. And that's what it's like when you're truly born again. Now, I'm not trying to say that in this crowd of people that we have here that everybody's living perfect because none of us have, have arrived. The Apostle yeah. Paul said, I have not apprehended, but I'll move forward to the calling of the high, the high calling of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we all know that we have not apprehended. But, but at the same time, I want you to know 
Praise God that if you got saved, just as you can feel the effects of the wind, your life should be different than what it was before. Even if you're living in open rebellion right now in your life, and it's a possibility that in this crowd, somebody could be living in open rebellion against God. You could literally be living in open rebellion. You could li literally be living a life, a secret life of sin and nobody would even really know it except for you and the Holy Spirit. And the problem with that is, and well, it's a, it's a problem. But even, if, but even if you are, if you're saved, the Holy Spirit from time to time, he's reminding you, he's convicting you, he's drawing you by his spirit and he's trying to get you to stop. Because he loves you. He loves me. Amen. When a person is regenerated, can you put up Titus chapter 3 verse 5? When a person is regenerated, it's like that breeze. The Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside. They're cleansed. Amen. They're transformed. And the result is a supernatural move of the Holy Spirit. And their life will never be the same. Titus 3 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Yes. When you get saved, you're plunged. There's another song. I'm not going to get somebody to sing it, but here's the lyrics. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Emmanuel is the name given by of Jesus according to Isaiah's prophecy in Matthew. He said, his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. There's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Praise God. With you, hallelujah. When you get saved and invite Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior into your heart, it's like the Holy Spirit takes you, boom, and he plunges you beneath the blood of Jesus where you become cleansed, you become washed in the blood of Jesus. The washing of regeneration is the first step and a recreation. That's the first step in the old passing away. And behold, oh, here comes amen. the new. Praise God. Yes. And then it's an ongoing processing along with the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And the more you yield to the renewing of the Holy Ghost, the more yield you receive. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. I think somebody said that recently. The more you yield, the more yield you get. Because yes. see, the word yield means harvest. That's good. So, so when I yield to you, he gives me more. Amen. And the, the rest of the scripture said the dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Yeah, you know, that's part of the problem with some of the goody, goody, goody two shoes in the world. See, if you ain't really been a sinner like me, you can't appreciate it. No, nah, that's not really true. You can't appreciate it. If the Lord really gets a hold of you. Because see, sometimes people are tormented in their mind. Amen. Come on. Sometimes people are tormented in their mind and in their emotional status. And, and, and the enemy is tormenting them. And, 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 and whenever they yield to the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit can come in and he can break that off of them. And he can set them free in that area of their life. And it's an amazing miracle. Amen. And so sometimes until a person really does see the Holy Spirit show up and do that miraculous work, it's kind of hard for them to see themselves as dirty as the thief on the cross. Come on. But I'm not as bad as you were, preacher. Mm. Mm. But the word of God says all have fallen short of the yes. word of God. Yes. Yes. Jesus had to die for everybody's sins. Right. People walking around here like, man... Look, I ain't never lied, stole, cheated. You know that's not even true because you know you stole that bubble gum from that little store back in. But, but I mean, a piece of bubble gum ain't that bad. What, 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 how bad does it have to be to send you to hell? The problem is that you're going to, the people going to hell because they rejected Jesus, not because of what they did. Everybody's fallen short. Everybody's sinned. Amen. Amen. So if the person continues to grow in truth and protects the presence of God, God's will for their lives, the spiritual transformation will be manifest outwardly by the fruit of the Spirit. You know, 
Look, I'm all, I love signs and wonders. I want you to know that I do. I love prophetic utterances. I love to see miracles. I love to see people healed. Yes. Praise God. But let me tell you something. The fruit of the Spirit, <laughs> I'd love to see some of that. Yeah. I'd love to see some of that in my life. I'd love to see some of that in all of our lives. Meaning, like, you may try to hurt me. You might try to talk behind my back. But guess what? I'm going to learn to love you. I'm going to learn to have long suffering with you. Because in reality, the word of God taught me that I'm not even in a wrestling match with you. I'm in a wrestling match with a demon spirit. And sometimes demon spirits use Christians. Uh-oh. Now we're really hitting a little too close to home. It's not even in my notes. Sometimes demon spirits use Christians to come against their brothers and sisters. They don't even realize it, but they're all tore up on the inside. They done got frustrated because something didn't go the way that they wanted it to go. Or somebody said something to them in a way that they felt like they were disrespected. And they want to hold on to their little sovereign piece of land. And they're like, no, you're going to, uh, you know, and they get frustrated. No, we got to learn how to be like our master. Yeah. He humbled himself. And whenever we learn to humble ourselves under his mighty hand, in due time, he will exalt us. He will, he will do the work that needs to be done in us. Amen. And so I'd love to see the fruit of the spirit manifest in our lives. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, goodness, faith, self-control, patience, kindness. These are outward truths physical manifestations that there's been an internal transformation in your heart in your life your husband will be able to see it your wife will be able to see it even your children will be able to see it your parents will be able to see it whenever that change takes place in your heart in your life and we got to work with the Holy Spirit this isn't in my notes either but let me there's this word I love this word and I've shared it with y'all a bunch of times this word, and so sooner or later, I don't really know it. You'd almost think I wanted to change the name of the church, but not really. Koinonia. Communion or fellowship. But you know what the word means? See, it can either be translated in English as this. This is the Greek word. It can either be translated as communion or fellowship, but you know what it means? It means joint participation. Mm. That means sometimes, and there's a scripture that says the communion of the Holy Spirit. Mm. When there, if you want the Holy Spirit to be in communion with you, to have a relationship with you, to be in fellowship with you, one of the things about the Holy Spirit is that he desires for us to joint participate with him. What does that mean? When he speaks, we listen. When we read the word of God, we obey it by his grace. By his grace, by his strength, by his power, we obey the word of God. Amen. Amen. So the, really the majority of my message is, I'm just now getting to my message. <laughs> as new creations in Christ, we received an inheritance. Amen. Hallelujah. Just as Ahab wants to steal Naboth's vineyard and inheritance, Satan wants to steal the inheritance of the saints. He wants to make a deal with you. He wants to make a deal with you. He wants to convince you that he's got something better for you. I'll talk more about that next week. It might be a part two. Both Naboth's name and his hometown have spiritual significance. Naboth means fruits. You can't make this stuff up. Naboth means fruits and Jezreel means son of God. Naboth is from Jezreel. To be sown of God means that God planted the seed. This means that the land was God's, that Naboth was called by God to bear or bring forth fruit for God. And in the story, Ahab wants to take from Naboth, Naboth what belongs to him. But look at Naboth's response. 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 3. I emphasized it when I read it, but let me read it again and then let me repeat it one time after that. Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbidden me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. I said, Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbidden me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. The Lord forbiddeth me, Satan, that I should give the inheritance that I have received for my God unto you, you lying intruder. You have no right up in this vineyard. You have no right up in this chicken coop. You have no right up in this garden.
garden. The land is very important to God. As far as his plan, listen to me. There's a big old plan out there that God's doing. The land is very important to God. It says in Leviticus, you can put this up there too. I want you to see this because it's so interesting to me. Leviticus 25, 23. This is the big plan of God. I want you to see this with me right here. Look what it says. The land, this is, now listen, you got to understand the time frame. This is the children of Israel. They're, he's about to bring them into the land of Canaan. In our time frame of Ahab, they've already been in there. We're in the time frame of the kings. They've already been in there probably for at least a thousand years, I would say. Into the land of Canaan is what it seems like. Yeah, 500 years, 600 years, something like that. The land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine. But look what he says right there. For you are strangers and sojourners with me. So he says, the land is mine, but you, Israel, are strangers and sojourners or travelers or pilgrims with me in the land. So this is the written word of God that Naboth would have had access to. And he says to Ahab, God forbid it me that I should give my inheritance of my fathers unto you. The Lord told us in the word of God, you might go off and marry Jezebel, buddy, even though you knew the word of God told you not to. But the Lord forbids me in his word that I'm going to give the inheritance of my fathers to you. And then the Lord saying to them, look what he says. He says that you are sojourners with me. This is quite a statement. See, the land is God's and his people of Israel are instructed not to sell it, right? Just follow me on this. He explains to them that they are fellow strangers and travelers in the land with him. And while the land belongs to God, he refers to himself as a stranger. You, you ever thought about these kinds of things? I mean, if you read the whole word of God, you'll start, you'll start really thinking. I just want to encourage you to, re, to try to get on a Bible reading schedule where you get the whole, because I'm telling you, anybody that's read the whole Bible, y'all know what I'm talking about. It's, it's just, wow. It starts opening up, right? The land belongs to God, but he refers to himself as... So the context is God created it, gave it to Adam. You with me? Adam lost it. Now God find, is finding others that he will trust, that will trust and obey his word. And he's taking it back one piece at a time. He's, well, part of his plan is to create a nation. He creates a nation of Israel and it had a certain plot of land. And he's going to use that land. So he's basically saying, I'm taking this back. Because see, God's not doing anything without the intervention of human beings. Because he created the physical realm for human beings. He gave authority to the human being. The human being released the authority to the liar. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more probably next week. Because I got a scripture that says that Satan said it has been delivered to me. But God's like, no, I'm taking it back because I got a plan. And he's willing to let you and I be part of that plan. So he just walks up in there and he's like, I might be a stranger and a sojourner of my own creation. Because I gave it to Adam and he relinquished it over to the enemy. But I'm about to take this plot of land back for myself right now. I'm about to create a nation that you've been incubating in Egypt. I done brought you out. You've been wandering in a wilderness for 40 years. But I'm about to put you in this land. Don't you sell that land. That land belongs to me. He's given you some geography within your personal person. And he said, don't you sell that land. The land he is giving them is a land that's been invaded by inhabitants. I don't have time to turn there. Well, no, go ahead. Let's go. We're going to do it. Leviticus chapter 18. Verses 25 through 27. I want you to see what God told Israel before he brought the children of Israel in there. He said, the land is defiled. Therefore, I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it. And the land itself vomits out her inhabitants. New paragraph. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments. Shall not commit any of these abominations. Neither any of your own nation. Nor any stranger that sojourns or travels among you. Next, next one. For all these abominations have the men of the land done. Which were before you and the land is defiled. 
There's so much to talk about right here. So much history. The, the Genesis chapter 6 narrative, the Nephilim, the giants in the land, the whole occult world, all of this stuff is going on in the midst of this land. They're defiling the land. They're practicing occultic magic. And here we are in America and we act like it's okay to abort however many, many millions of babies that we abort. Here we are in America and we act like it's not a big deal for them, for us to scroll through social media and for them to convince us that transgenderism is okay, that homosexuality is okay, and we just oh, it's not that big of a deal. The land is being polluted. Yes. It's God's land. I kind of preach you to get you in trouble, preacher. Yes, <laughs> it will. But Naboth died, and the devil can't kill nobody unless the Lord is done with their destiny. I believe that with all of my heart. Let's quit walking around this rock called earth in fear. Ain't nobody going to take you out of this ball game until the Lord's ready to take you home. Good word. Adam allowed a deceptive lie to bring darkness into the realm that God had given him to have authority over. The result of Adam's decision not only caused a personal problem with sin, but it also brought sin into the land. If you let the serpent in your garden, he's going to end up in your chicken coop. And he ain't going to have no eggs. He's going to steal your inheritance. He's going to cause trouble in your house. Help us. Now, thousands of years later, God is giving land back to his people Israel. He's saying, right now, we're strangers together in our own land. And again, it's bigger than this because God has taken this whole world back. It's the whole world, the whole earth. But it starts right here with Israel. It, it starts right here with Naboth's vineyard. It starts with Shammah's pea patch. <laughs> we'll read that one next week. It starts here with your house, with your family. It starts here with this church. And anyone willing to join us in this area and anyone we're willing to join with that's willing to say, hey, we need to work in unity together because as the days get dark, we need the church to wake up. Here's my lamp, Lord. I want to be a wise virgin, oh Lord. Fill my lamp with oil. Let my light burn bright because in the midst of darkness, the light always burns bright. Amen. Yes. He said we're taking it back one piece at a time, one step at a time. God would say, you have to trust me. I have a plan. Don't sell the land. The land is mine. I'm taking back what belongs to me. And I'm allowing you, my people, to work with me. While I'm taking it back. But you can't let the snake into the garden. And you can't let Jezebel into the kingdom. And now Ahab wants Naboth to do what Adam did. Ahab wants Naboth's vineyard. He wants Naboth's fruits. He wants Naboth's inheritance. But we already know Naboth said, the Lord forbidden me that I should give you the inheritance of my father. Amen. Adam gave Satan a foothold through disobedience. Ahab gave Jezebel a foothold when he transgressed the written word of God and married an unbeliever. Paul said, don't give place to the devil, which means don't give a foothold to the devil. Satan infiltrated God's kingdom, but God is reclaiming it all through the lives of his people. He's wanting to look for somebody like you today. He's wanting to look for somebody like you back there. A man to hand Gerald. Hallelujah, Miss Kathy. Praise God. Mama, he's looking for somebody like you. You never know. The worker might come over to your house to check the cable, Mama. The least you can do is just tell the old fella about Jesus. Hallelujah, and how Jesus ministered to your heart. No, you ain't done with your mama. You still kicking. You still got a breath in your lungs. Don't let that cable man come to your house and leave without hearing about Jesus. Tell him your testimony like Solomon. Mm. What kind of testimony does Grant? Oh, she got a testimony. Come on. Will she let the Lord use it? I don't know. That's going to be between her and the Lord, but she got a testimony. Praise God. Oh, Lord, God. So he wants to partner with people, amen? He wants to bring a harvest. You know, and I've preached this recently about the harvest. That sometimes you just don't see it happen. I was blessed doing this little two-day escapade. I went to this thing, and one of, one of Pastor Tommy's uh, sons came up to me after the, after the prophet gave me a word about being a planting trees. And he said, bro, I've been meaning to tell you this the next time I saw you. And I'm like, what's up? He said, man, he said, look, 
He said, I don't even know the girl's name, but some girl he was at the urgent care. And, and he said, I don't even remember exactly what happened. She, but basically, long story short, she had opened up a door through some kind of assault, something she did. He said, I don't even know for sure what she did, but she was being tormented. And he said, and I don't remember the situation, but he said, he said, and something you said just snatched. She got in her car and it snapped and it was broken. And the Lord brought freedom. I'm thinking to myself, this kid never came and told me this. I never know it. Half the time, listen, you pray for people to receive their healing any way you want to. And I'm not against people that want to judge how, you know, how the, whether it was a 10 and now it's an 8. I think that that's all fine and dandy. But for me, like, I'm just going to believe God. I'll walk up in that stasio and lay hands on that man's knee and I'm going to believe God healed his knee. Praise God. And if the Lord wants me to see the healing, he'll come back and tell me about it. I, I never asked that girl whether she was going to be free. How he never, if he would have never told me, I would have never known it. But I guess the Lord wanted me to know it. He said, dude. Whatever it was that was on her snap, she called her daddy up and told him about what happened. And her dad works for me. And he said, I've been over here planting little seeds here and there. And then all of a sudden, her daddy starts telling me the story. And her dad's like, you know this dude? He's like, yeah, man, it's like Matt Amen or something like that. He said, all of a sudden, dude, everybody, everybody's listening. He said, I talked to myself. I've been planting seeds, but now's the time. He said, I stood up and I started talking to him about Jesus. And I've been trying to say, praise God. Praise God. That's what we're called to do. To plant seeds. I don't need you to show me. Lord, I thank you so much when you let me see just a little bit. Oh, he's so good. But can you imagine all the things that have happened in our past where we planted seeds and we don't even know. We're not even going to know until we get to glory. Robert and I used to talk about it all the time. We're not going to always know everything on this side. But I believe with all of my heart, that what we do has an impact for the kingdom. Yes, Amen. hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So there's darkness on the earth. I just skipped a bunch of stuff because it's getting late. But I wanted to share with you that in the midst of darkness, because one of the songs that y'all uh, sang talked about the light of the world, right? Yes. And whenever y'all were singing it, I was like, there you go again, Lord. Because yes. I wanted to end with two passages, so I'm not going to get the music ministry to come up yet, but in John chapter 1, in verse 14, it says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. Amen? But I wanted to read to you actually verses John chapter chapter 1 Verses 1 through 13. There was one specific spot I wanted you to see. So you can put John chapter 1. You can start in verse 1 up there for us, Haley. And I'm just going to read it out of this Bible. I kind of like, I'm going back to wanting to turn some pages every now and then. Praise God. Go back more old school. All this electronic stuff. I like my electronics. But you get the point. I want to tow the Bible around. Praise God. And a big one so they can see it. <laughs> in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness and the darkness comprehends it not. Some newer translations say the darkness could not overcome it. And then there was a man sent from God whose name was John. And the same came to be a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. Talk about Jesus. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lights every man that comes into the world. He was in the world. The world was made by him. The world knew him not. He came unto his own. And his own received him not, but as many as received him to them, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Praise God. Yeah. So the world is filled with darkness because of the first Adam and the decision that he made. And then God, I think about this a lot, and I don't know if I can really do a good job. Have you ever seen a shooting star before? Yeah. 
I've seen a few shooting stars, especially whenever you get offshore and you're in the woods and there's no lights around. And if you can imagine that shooting star, you can see, and this, and I'm gonna be getting into some of this on Wednesday night. The first atom was made from the earth. The second atom, he came from heaven. That's right. It's like God sent a life from heaven to come into the midst of darkness. If you saw the chosen, the first one in the chosen, or one of the, I don't know if it was the first one or the second one, but you don't have to even watch the chosen. You just go back and read John chapter one, the whole thing. Because it says that, it says that John and Peter's brother, Andrew, were with John the Baptist. They were actually disciples of John the Baptist. And then all of a sudden, He's, John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. Yes. And the Bible says at that point in time, John and Andrew, they disconnected from John. <laughs> they connected themselves to Jesus. And then the next thing you know, Andrew's running over there to Peter. We found him. Yes. What are you talking about? We found the Messiah. We found the one we've been waiting on. And that light that came from heaven Hallelujah. in the midst of darkness lit and brought light to those two men and they started to bring that light wherever they went and this light listen I wonder what it looks like I think about this man I think I put it in this in some of my notes for Wednesday night I'm sorry I'm going longer than I realized but look I think to myself we were called to bring the glory of God upon the earth yes. the radiance the splendor the glory of God upon the earth I wonder what the earth looks like from heaven when God looks at it. I wonder what it, on that day when he remembered that he sent Jesus inside of, of Mary and he allowed him to be birthed and how when he became a man that that light started to spread and now 2,000 years later, I wonder what it looks like when he's looking just as the moon reflects the glory of the sun that the earth spiritually will start to reflect the glory of of the son, his son, and he sees that, that each time, it says that he was the light, the life, and the life was the light of men, and that it lightens every man, and it's really in the context that will believe, and so as soon as you're ready to believe, your light gets turned on, and it's like the earth is filled with his glory. And he's up there and he's looking. He's like, boy, look at this little area. I'm just thinking to myself, look at this area right here in Patterson, man. Hey, wouldn't that be good? Or wherever, the other, pre the other people that are going to make it happen. And the Lord going to pour his spirit out. And there's more and more lights that are burning. And in the eyes of the Father, he's seeing the splendor and the glory. See, that's his plan. He said, as surely as I live, I can't get off of that scripture in Numbers chapter 14, verse 21. As surely as I live, the glory of the Lord will fill the earth. Yes. The Lord is wanting to turn your light on, my friend. Yes. Let your, don't light, hide your candle under a bushel. A city on a hill cannot be hid. Let your light, let your light be seen by men. Let your works be seen by men that it might glorify your Father in heaven. Amen? Amen. So that's what I wanted you to see in that passage. Now I'm going to just close with this last little thing. Singers, musicians, y'all can come forward. Praise God. The light in the midst of darkness. I was reading this particular parable in this little workbook that I bought recently. <laughs> It's just straight scripture, but I'm going to read it to you. It comes out of Luke chapter 19, verse 11. You can follow it. It says, as they heard these things, he added and spoke a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. So everybody's expecting, right, that, oh, it's going to happen tomorrow. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. You see how similar this is to the vineyard we just read? And he called his ten servants and he delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. So I'm going to give you a little something, something. I need you to occupy. I'm looking for a return. I'm looking for a return. And he says, But his citizens hated him. Does that not sound like the world? Hating on Jesus. And sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And that's exactly the world, is it not? 
And it has been some of us at times in our walk. We will not have this man to reign over us. Aren't you glad you finally bowed your knee? Praise you, Jesus. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, your pound has gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful and a very little have authority over 10 cities. You starting to get a little bit of a picture now of what it's going to look like on the other side. Do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus just made this little story up? No, Jesus put this story in here so that we can understand that there really is something on the other side. And I'm telling you, church, I don't know if they preach this in other churches. I'm sure they do. But not every church. Because most people, okay, I'm just going to say it. Most people are looking to go buy Joel's book, Your Best Life Now. Most people are looking to be happy, happy now. And sometimes there's joy. The joy of the Lord will be your strength. But sometimes there's trial and tribulation. It's not here just to make you happy. It's here for you to occupy and to be productive with what it is that he's giving you. To share your witness and your light. Amen. To do good works for the Lord. That other people would know that this thing is real. Listen. You can't earn your way into heaven. But you can earn a reward. That's right. right. And it's not just. And your motives have to be right. You can't. Your motives can't even be wrong. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? I hope it makes sense. I'm trying to get it across to you. Because I've been preaching this for 10 years. And I'm now really just starting to believe it. Like I should have believed it 10 years ago. Like this stuff's real. This ain't no game we're playing. Amen. Help us, Lord. All right, let's keep going. The same came saying, Lord, your pound has gained five pounds. And he said, likewise to him, be thou over five cities. And another came saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have laid up in a napkin. For I feared you, because you are an austere man. The word means to be exacting, hard, severe. In other words, you can say it like this. He means business, y'all. That you're an austere man and that you take up that thou layest not down and you reap that which you did not sow. In other words, if I, if I hire you to put seed in the ground and to harvest it, you're going to get your cut, but it belongs to me. Right? And he says unto him, out of your own mouth will I judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou money to the bank? That, that, at thy coming, I might have required my own with usury. And he said unto them that stood by, take from him the pound and give it to him that has ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he has ten pounds. <laughs> Look, I know I, I've kept y'all so long and I appreciate y'all working with me, but I can't help but think about this. I'm thinking to myself, like, what kind of world do we live in today? Well, that's not fair. That junior high has won ten championships. They already got ten trophies. Yeah, and next year they'll have 11 because they're working hard to win. <laughs> and, uh, oh, no, I want you to give me some of their trophies. <laughs> I want a trophy, too. I want a good grade, too. I want a ribbon, too. No, you don't get a ribbon because you didn't wake up early enough in the morning to study for your test to win the valedictorian of your class. Therefore, you don't get a ribbon. Junior? Okay, Lord help uh, Isn't that true, though? It is true. If your son's name is Junior, that was not a problem. <laughs> For I say unto you that unto everyone which has shall be given, and from him that has not, even that he has shall be taken away from him. God's expecting us to do something with what he gave us. But those my enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring them here and slay them before me. Wow. Boy, do they read that? <laughs> Woo. I don't know about you, but that's sobering. 